What's good, guys? Welcome to my channel where I hope you to love the scriptures and to reform to the word of God. And as you guys can see, I got my best friend, Joshua Janair. Don't even need to introduce himself. He's been here a lot. Um, just tell the people what we're going to be talking about. You can introduce the topic. Um, yeah, we're going to talk about, since Sam is doing a, a series on the Trinity, we're going to talk about the Trinitarian way of salvation. Because when we think of the Trinity, the triune God, it is fully revealed in the gospel of our Lord Jesus Christ. And before you get into that, I encourage you guys who are watching for the first time to hit the subscribe button and hit the bell to be notified every time I post another video. And do me a favor and smash that like button. So, Joshua, get us right into it. The Trinitarian way of salvation. Yeah, I, I would just like to start out with a Reformed Confessions. Um, question and answer 65 of the Heidelberg Catechism says, Since then we are made partakers of Christ and all his benefits by faith only. Whence doth this faith proceed? from the Holy Ghost who works faith in our hearts by the preaching of the gospel and confirms it by the use of the sacraments. And scripture proof is Ephesians 2a, Ephesians 6.23, and Philippians 1.29. Faith is a gift that is granted by God. Now, how is it granted to us? By the order of application of the Holy Spirit. Now, I want to, that we can't, we don't want to, um, mix the two right there's the order of salvation and then the order of application right this is what herman bobbing writes in his reform dogmatics um what christ gained for us is complete but must be applied to in to and in us in, in justification and sanctification freedom from guilt pollution and power of sin so this is the example that Bavin gives just as a child even before birth has a claim on all the goods of his his or her father only at much later age enters into possession of it so also all those who will who will later believe have long before they believe ownership rights in Christ to all the benefits he has acquired, but only enter into possession of them by faith. So we believe in, a, in, a, in an atonement that is definite, that Christ dies for his sheep, as he says in John chapter 10. Christ has won for us the forgiveness of sins, justification, sanctification, and eternal life. Now, Christ has won for the, uh, us eternal life in a redemptive historical act. And that redemptive historical act has to follow the subjective order of application. And John Calvin gets at this because John Calvin is known for union with Christ, that the benefits, as Paul says in Ephesians 1, that God has blessed us with every spiritual benefits in Christ. If those benefits are only found in Christ, therefore, the objective, the objective redemptive act is the crucifixion and resurrection and ascension of Christ. That must also follow the subjective application in order that those benefits that Christ has won for us may become ours. As long as Christ is outside of us, he and his benefits are no use to us. In order for us to become, in order for us to become partakers of Christ and His benefits, we need faith. And how is that faith granted to us in the subjective order of application? And we can define it, and we can go into the order of application after you speak, Sam. And that you know, our favorite hymn. It just reminds me of our favorite hymn. It says, "No condemnation now. I dread Jesus, and all in Him is mine." So, can you speak about the application and how the Holy Spirit Himself comes? and applies the work of Christ on, on behalf of the believer. Yeah, of course. Um, Paul says in Romans chapter 8, um, for those whom he foreknew, he also predestined to be conformed to the image of his son in order that he might be the firstborn among many brothers. And those whom he predestined, he also called. So we'll get into that. Those whom God has predestined, go, those whom God has entered into a relationship before the foundation of the world, he will also call them. And what is effectual calling? Our Reformed Confession says that our effectual calling happens by the ministry of the word, that the gospel is preached to sinners who are fallen in Adam, and then therefore, through the word of God, and through the Holy Spirit, not, not remember the as we talked about la, the the last video we did that the power of regeneration is not in the Word of God, but in the application of the Holy Spirit. So through the preaching of the gospel and through the Holy Spirit changing the disposition of our hearts, we go from fallen under Adam 
into union with Christ. And the way we think about the order of application, we think about it soteriology, right? We believe effectual calling and then faith, no, effectual calling, regeneration, faith and repentance, justification, sanctification, union with Christ. That would be the order of application. But the first, the four, the first application of salvation is the effectual calling that through the ministry of the word, the Holy Spirit effectually calls us to Christ, regenerates us and grants us faith and repentance. And that would go into the latter half of what Paul said, that those who are called, those who are effectually called, regenerated and granted faith by the Holy Spirit, they are also justified. And those who are justified, there has to be sanctification. There's justification, glorification, there has to be sanctification in between. So it's a given that those who are justified are also being sanctified by the holy spirit and ultimately they will be glorified and that's mm -hmm. when we talk about the order of application the subjective order of ap application and I, I liked romans 8 30 a lot because there's a lot of critics of reformed theology that I like to say and i've heard someone say this that effectual calling is not found anywhere in the bible but in romans chapter 8 verse 30 like he said it says those whom he predestined he also called and those whom he called he also justified we know that this is an effectual calling and not a general call of the gospel because, like he said, it leads to justification. And we know that not all those who are called and to faith and repentance will end up being justified. So this is how we know it's an effectual calling that leads to justification and then the process of sanctification between glorification. Um, but yeah, bro, next point. You're muted. I'm sorry. I want to read this quote by one of my favorite scholastics, Francis Turretin. Effectual calling is an act of grace of God in Christ by which he calls men dead in sin and lost in Adam through the preaching of the gospel and the power of the Holy Spirit to union with him and to salvation obtained in him. Um, so that would be the the. So we have the ordu salutis that God cho chooses a people in before the foundation of the world in Jesus Christ, as Ephesians 1 says. Therefore, so the, how are the three persons of the Trinity active? The Father chooses a people in his son. So this would have to do with the covenant of redemption and the nature of election. The father chooses the people in his son. The son willingly submits to be the mediator for these people and to reconcile them back to God. And then the son willingly submits, comes and dies, fulfilling his role as mediator, prophet, priest, and king. He comes and dies. And the, Jesus has the Holy Spirit at his disposal in order that through the preaching of the gospel, he might bring and change the hearts of these dead sinners in order that they can be reconciled to their God. And just, just, you know, like, like I would say that there's, there's a lot of, um, we, the, the Arminians would deny, deny this and Roman Catholics would deny this as well. They believe that grace essentially elevates man's nature, that the supernatural graces of God can only be found in the institution of the church. And that all that grace does is that elevates, elevates man natural, natural religion to supernatural religion. So they don't believe that salvation is initiated by the, by God choosing a people in his son, God sending his son. What well, we see this in the gospel, right? The father sends the son. The son willingly submits to his father and he comes to die for his people. Yep. The son... A basic verse for this. Everybody knows it. John 3.16. Yeah, John 3.16. For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son that whosoever believeth in him shall have eternal life. Now, how do we come in possession of eternal life? Christ has won for us eternal life. So how do we become in possession of it? And we see this in the life of Jesus Christ. The father sends the son. The son comes and dies. The son rises from the dead. He ascends into heaven. And then he, the father and the son send the Holy Spirit. The day of Pentecost, an objective act of redemptive history, is also followed with the subjective act of applying the benefits of Jesus Christ. Because where did Christ win for us eternal life? In his resurrection, how do we come, how do we be, how do we become partakers of Christ and his benefits by the subjective order of application, which is usually through the ministry of the word, through the preaching of the gospel, and this is denied, but this is what the Bible says. This is why Paul says that we are ambassadors for Christ. We tell others what God has objectively done in His Son Jesus Christ, and it is God and it is God alone that follows with the subjective order of application.
Yes, sir. Facts. Um, you know, John 316 and John 17 and John 6, it doesn't work in oneness Pentecostalism. It doesn't work in modalism because like we just quoted John 316, for God so loved the world that he sent his only begotten son. And this shows the eternality of the son that before the foundation of the world, he chose a people in himself and he sent the son who was with him for eternity to accomplish the work of redemption and that doesn't work in one is pentecostalism because in one is pentecostalism god is one being who exists in one person and before the foundation of the world there was just one person up there in heaven so who is he sending and you know what i'm saying so it doesn't work in modalism it doesn't work in one is pentecostalism it doesn't work in the jw theology Jehovah's witnesses it doesn't work in more mormonism so yeah. um, i have to and, keep more to that and yeah just and that's the thing like when, when, when we call ourselves reformed, what we're saying is that we are reformed and Catholic. We hold to the Catholic creeds and confessions of the early church. And what, what does the early church say about the Holy Spirit, right? It talks about the son. I believe in the, I believe in one Lord Jesus Christ, the only begotten son of God, begotten of the father before all worlds. It also says he was crucified for us under Pontius Pilate. He suffered and was buried. These are objective acts in redemptive history. And then what does it say about the Holy Spirit? I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Lord and the giver of life that just as God said, let there be light, right? As we see that, we see that in second Corinthians, second Corinthians chapter four, right? That, 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 that the Holy Spirit opens up our minds to the light of the glory of God in the face of Jesus Christ. And this is only that, that salvation is initiated by the Holy Spirit alone. We believe in the Holy Spirit and the Lord and the giver of life. The Holy Spirit works directly in our effectual calling and in regeneration through the, through the preaching of the word. You're mute. You're muted. Ah, <laughs> uh, well, I just want to read John chapter six real quick, but um, to show you the Trinitarian harmony and redemption and salvation. John chapter six, verse thirty-five through forty, very well-known passage and a, a passage that a lot of Reformed theologians like to use. It says, "Jesus said to them, I am the bread of life.'" He who comes to me will not hunger, and he who believes in me will never thirst. But I said to you that you have seen me and yet do not believe. All that the Father what gives me will come to me, and the one who comes to me I will certainly not cast out. For I have come down from heaven not to do my own will, but the will of him who sent me. This is the will of him who sent me, that all that he has given me, I lose nothing but raise it up on the last day. But this is the will of my Father, that everyone who beholds the Son and believes in him will have eternal life, and I myself will raise him up on the last day. So like we've been talking about the whole video, what we see is the Father choosing a people in himself, giving them to the Son as a love gift, and the Son redeeming them and ultimately raising them up on the last day. And in John chapter 16 and 15, we see Jesus talking about him and the Father sending the Holy Spirit to apply that work. So this yeah. is the Trinitarian salvation this is this is the orthodox belief the, the church and has believed this since the time of paul yeah, exactly um this is what the bible teaches right when we speak of god's covenant of grace it is a gracious and trinitarian covenant right it starts with the election of the father the son coming to die and the father and the son sending the spirit right and even now, just to end off with this, even now as Christians, there's the ongoing working of the Holy Spirit because of the objective act is true. And then therefore the subjective order of application follows. There is an ongoing working of the Holy Spirit. We have eternal life and we're being sanctified, right? That the Holy Spirit is not that through our power, the Holy Spirit helps us to live up to our covenantal obligations. As Paul says in Romans chapter six, shall we continue to sin that grace may abound? Why don't, why as Christians, those who have been in a state of those who are, has been translated as Westminster nine says into a state of grace, how how can they live up to their covenantal obligations? It is not necessarily the power that is in them, but it's the ongoing work of the Holy Spirit in order that they may fulfill their covenantal obligations. Amen, brother. I love that. If you got anything else to say, just say it now, but that's the video. That's what we got for you guys. Um, I love you, bro. Thank you for coming on. Oh, you too, bro. Thank you for having me. It's an honor. Sure. Sure. But yeah, guys, if you guys love that video, I heard you hit the like button and hit the subscribe button and hit the bell so you notified every time I post another video. If you got any one of Pentecostal friends, send this to them. Modalist friends, send this to them. And if just friends who want to learn more about salvation and the Trinity, send this to them as well.
I'll see you guys in the next video.